Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. Hey, it's Marvin. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba and our discussion of our July 2021 book club pick, An Ocean of Minutes by Tia Lim. This is just a quick content warning that there is a brief discussion of a sexual assault scene from the book. So if that kind of discussion makes you uncomfortable, um, please check out the time code listed in the show notes and just skip ahead about a minute and a half and you should be in the clear. All right, now to the show. You're listening to Whoa! Hot And you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yeh. And I'm Rira Yu. And it is time, time, eh? Eh? Get it? Uh. To talk about our July 2021 book club pick, An Ocean of Minutes by Tia Lim. So, Marvin, how did you like this book since it's a change of pace from our last month's pick, Happy Endings, which was <laughs> a very raunchy romance novel i did enjoy it um thank you for picking a sci-fi story to um to dig our teeth into it turned out to be a story that i wasn't expecting it to become and i was actually really surprised but you know i'm glad to have read it and excited to be discussing it with you yeah it really did subvert a lot of my expectations for like time travel stories i've consumed a lot of time travel stories and movies in in my life (laughs) so um it, it was definitely different from what i'm used to yeah all right so let's just get straight into it um because it is hot and to record this podcast we both have to turn off our ac so uh before we roast alive in the southern california heat wave uh, let's let's talk about ocean of minutes um this is your standard spoiler warning our discussion will encompass all things in ocean of minutes including uh plot spoilers and themes so if you haven't read the book yet and don't want to be spoiled you know, go read the book now and come back and listen to us after you've finished. And if you don't care or if um, being spoiled is a bonus or a feature of this podcast for you, then please just keep listening. I, I do have to say that this is one of those books where you should probably read it before listening to this episode. <laughs> like, I, I feel like your experience would be a little bit ruined if you knew the ending and a lot of the plot twists. So, mm. You know, that's my advice. Rira's recommendations. All right. So let's get started. Rira, can you um, read us into Enosha Minutes? In this novel, America is in the grip of a deadly flu pandemic. When Frank catches the virus, his girlfriend Polly will do whatever it takes to save him, even if it means risking everything. When she finds out there's a company that has invented time travel, she agrees to a radical contract. If she signs up for a one-way trip into the future to work as a bonded laborer, 
the company will pay for the life-saving treatment Frank needs. Polly promises to meet Frank again in Galveston, Texas, where she will arrive in 12 years. But when Polly is rerouted an extra five years into the future, Frank is nowhere to be found. Alone in a transformed and divided America with no status and no money, Polly must navigate a new life and find a way to locate Frank, determine if he is alive, and if their love has endured. So I was pretty surprised that for a time travel novel, it was set in the past. Because yeah. usually when you travel into the future, it's like a time period that we haven't uh, experienced in, in like real life. But the future in this book is 2002. Yeah, it was actually it took me a while to wrap my head around the fact that this takes place in an alternate timeline. It's an it's an AU um, of our timeline where a mutated flu pandemic sweeps the nation slash the world. And, um, you know. Nothing like current times. Nothing, nothing like what's happening right now. The United yeah, States. Yeah, that that was a thing. I was like, this book came out in 2018, and you know, when people were reading it, it was like, oh, this is what life would be like if a pandemic hit. You know, it's like an alternate. Yeah. But but now that we are living through a pandemic, and we have been living through one for the past like year and like whatever months, <laughs> uh, almost two years at this point, we're just like. Yeah, like a lot of similarities and a lot of parallels. I mean, this is what we've been seeing a long time from science fiction authors is this ability to semi-predict how specifically the United States government will react to a pandemic, which is insist nothing is wrong and until it's too late. Yeah, because um, forgive me if I'm incorrect, the last like dystopia, apocalyptic novel that we read was Severance by Ling Ma. And that book was also about um, capitalism and how, <laughs> like, America would be really bad at dealing with the pandemic. But at the same time, capitalism will endure in some way. <laughs> yeah, it was a really interesting, um, I guess, literary move for Tia to do that. It's, But I guess it also gives her the chance to, like, because we've always talked about this in terms of, like, contemporary fiction, which is, like, Having access to the internet and cell phones changes the game. And like setting it in the 80s and 90s, which is a time before widespread use of the internet, it creates a setting where communication is w way harder than, than it would have been, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that was like one of the reasons why uh, Tia uh, set this book like at the turn of like the 20th <laughs> century. I think like because in the back of, um, the paperback there is a q a with her and and she said that like that was one of the main reasons why um yeah. you can't yeah like if you think about it if someone from the 80s time travel to i guess like the 2020s 2010s they would just be so confused with our lives with smartphones and like we like wi-fi <laughs> it would be like we were all living like kings and queens right because i remember in like the late 90s i had a prized 386 computer where i was able to play games like x-wing or whatever but like that computer probably cost twice as much as your standard smartphone and is probably like the tenth of the power i mean that's just how much technology has grown in the, over the last like 10 years even yeah i mean like in terms of communication um i'm just thinking about long distance relationships during like our <laughs> parents era and i'm yeah. like Yo, they had to like do it the old fashioned way the with phone letters cards. and the phone card. Yeah. The phone card. Oh my god. I used the phone card when I had to like call my grandparents. Yeah. And yeah, you could only call like maybe like once a month <laughs> because of the rates. But now we have like WhatsApp and Zoom and it's just so much easier to contact everyone. And yeah, like it would be a totally different book and the struggles would just not exist if this was taking place in like the mid 2000s 2010s so one thing that was really i guess curious to me was the fact that time travel was invented but they couldn't go back in time to reach patient zero because there was like a limit on like how far they can go back yeah how much did you think that was real and how much do you think that was bullshit see like the entire time i thought it was bullshit <laughs> like i thought that the company that like made the time travel thing uh, exists maybe they couldn't go back to patient zero but they probably could have impacted like how the pandemic would spread 
but they chose not to in order to capitalize on it. Because we've seen this in real life where real corporations will exacerbate like, um, like, I don't know, like climate change and environmentalism to benefit their own pockets. So- I mean, I guess um, the examples that come to mind is Enron in, I think that was 2001, 2002, where they um, purposely jacked up the price of like energy during like the big wildfires that were happening in, in California. Um, and then I'm thinking like, you know, pharmaceutical companies who have been accused of withholding like more advanced medications because the less effective ones haven't played out its lifespan of profit yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I was like, uh, it kind of sounds like bullshit, but you know, <laughs> you're they, just they too can't cynical. You're like, you don't believe anything, anything, cor- any corporation that is, says. That is right? true. When I was reading this book, I realized the extent of my cynicism. <laughs> I was like, this book is supposed to, be, I mean, a lot of sad depressing things happen to Polly and of course like a lot of real life parallels are in this book but the entire time I was like I don't know if this would happen or I would say that's not like why would you be so naive as to like do this when the benefit isn't I don't know worth it I mean it could be that um time travel paradox was it the um the grandfather paradox where in order for time travel to be invented, the pandemic had to have happened, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's true because time travel was invented in 1993 and they were able to go back as far as what, like 1981, which is like the time period that uh, Polly and Frank are from. Because mm-hmm. like th- when they're dating, it's still like the late 70s. So yeah. we go from like 1978, 79 to like... 1998 yeah 1998 where were you in 1998 uh in 1998 oh god it was was i still in new jersey (laughs) i think i may have still been in new jersey and in middle school i was a freshman in high school i had just entered high school wait never mind yeah i would i would have been eight years old so i was definitely (laughs) not in middle school I I have no recollection of like my middle school years, my elementary school years, except for the really really traumatic stuff. Oh but, no, yeah. Um, but yeah, like. So you're not one of those people who looks back on the good old days of high school and middle school. Um, no, because those... once the internet happened, that was when I started to have friends and realized <laughs> that I was actually. I don't know, like worthwhile as a human being. Oh, no. so, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, like mm. not exactly. Uh, remember back in the nineties, like yeah, like I'm not much of like a nineties aficionado when it comes to like, <laughs> like. So the current uh, trend of like nineties nostalgia is doing nothing for you. No, it absolutely not. The only <laughs> nostalgia I have for the nineties is probably like anime related mm. but that's pretty much it like anime and pokemon and mm-hmm. that is that's pretty true. much that's it true. <laughs> but nostalgia is a big theme in this book um especially since it's set in like the 80s and the 90s i feel like those time periods are known for its nostalgia the most i mean turn on the radio and it's mostly like 80s rock band and 90s <laughs> hip hop. <laughs> I mean, that's considered classic music now, right? For better or worse. I think I think we've passed 80s nostalgia and we've moved into 90s nostalgia and even early 2000s nostalgia. I've been seeing some trends from when I was in high school coming back and I don't know whether to be happy or sad about it. Emo music, quote unquote, emo pops coming back. Like I've been seeing people like youth around me dressed like we did with like the baggy pants with like you know what else coming back? Bucket hats. I've been seeing a lot more bucket hats. I lately. love bucket hats. Okay. Like <laughs> I, I used to wear them all the time and I even wore them like in college. Love it. I mean, that's never going to go out of fashion. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, the late nineties was also like the, um, I guess it was the second wave of K-pop, which is like the, the SES days, the HOT days. Like that's the first wave. That that's is the first not wave. The sec- yeah. That's the first wave because K-pop became popularized with HOT and they came out in like 1995. Oh, okay. Yes, I know my fucking K-pop history. <laughs> <All right. laughs> like, 
I assume there the was second, a generation before them, but I guess the not. The second wave is around 2003. So that's with like TVXQ. And, oh, that's like all um, the big girl like, groups and stuff, right? Like the giant, yeah. the giant groups. Like, uh, what what year did Girls Generation come out? I I know that like K-pop like kind of blew up internationally, like outside of LA, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in like 2009. But so the that's generation when, like, YouTube became like a big thing. But the generation with like the bucket hats and like the oversized jerseys that was first the first yeah that was that was first gen that was because like you have to think (laughs) about like hip-hop because hip-hop was all about like the bucket hat and like clothes and like the shoes i mean shoes are still like a big deal in hip-hop anyway we're probably gonna cut this part out no it's keep we're staying in we're this 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 has been your k-pop education minute you know what else is coming back vans and skater wear they've never gone away really yeah, I don't think they've ever gone away. Maybe they're becoming more popular now, but I feel like it's always been a part of like, I don't know, like streetwear. And that's, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> trends trends come and go. And kids, you'll realize that um, you should keep all of your clothes because trends come back and you don't want to spend extra money on. I know. On my stuff that they're gonna over place. my partner came to my place and did a cleansing of all the stuff that doesn't bring her joy, and so all the clothes that have come back around, I don't no longer have. Like I don't have any of my baggy clothes. I don't have my baggy jeans, my visors, my bucket hats. All the stuff that she does not want me to wear anymore is gone. There are clothes that I've definitely taken from like my mom's closet mm-hmm. and. You know, my mom got it from like my grandmother because she like made those clothes. <laughs> so it's yeah, like things, things, things come back. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, anyways, sorry. Um, so what did you think about the bureaucracy of getting <laughs> of of time traveling? Because you see this in immigration and like yeah. refugee. Uh, I actually want to talk about that. Um, I was really surprised that this time travel story wasn't actually really about time travel. I mean, time travel is the setting, and it's like the the um the mechanism by which this story functions. But the story is really about like a refugee immigrant experience, right? Like Polly is essentially a time migrant worker, right? Like she travels through time specifically to work in order to pay off that the cost of like a loan that she takes out to A, save Frank's life and B, pay for the time travel. And she has to pay for like her lodging and pay for her meals and her like expenses, which is something that like. Like it's basically indentured servitude, and something, and it's something that like a lot of like, I don't know if it happens in the states as much. It probably does, but definitely probably in like does. Asia, in like factory towns where like you have people coming from the countryside to work at a factory who live in company dorms and like live in company towns. Like it's something that happens to them too. Like they have a company credit, they get kind of sucked in, and they kind of have to live there to pay off their debts. Right. In order to and survive. the thing is, they keep adding expenses, so you don't actually get the chance to leave when you <laughs> want to. Yeah, which is like the oldest. Like it's been, it's basically how these like these types of companies have functioned since the industrial revolution, right? Um, and so, reading the book reminded me of there's a song by um, Chinese American artist Vienna Tang called "No Gringo." Um, oh, I think it was yeah, part of yeah. her third album. Which is about like a hypothetical future where the border with Mexico has inversed, and basically people from America would sneak into Mexico for jobs and economic stability. And it's kind of it reminded me of that, where it's like time travel becomes a new border, and the delineation is no longer well. It's still white and brown, white and black, but also like past and future, right? Like people who don't belong here, people who come here just to work and how they're treated as second-class citizens. And it was interesting how like Polly, who is like a white passing Middle Eastern woman, right? Like Lebanese. Yeah, she's, she's mixed race. So she's um, part Lebanese and and part white. Which Lebanese still counts as Caucasian, right? I'm like, yeah, like actually Caucasian. Cause you know how (laughs) people say like, Oh, I'm Caucasian, but it's like the, the origin of Caucasian is you live in the Caucasus area in yeah. in like like between Asia and Europe, and it's mm. just yeah. Anyway, that's a different yeah. 
thing. But, but it's used as code as white. And like Polly also uses it as like, I guess it means I'm white, like Caucasian, right? She says Caucasian instead of white because. I mean, isn't that what's like on government forms, though? I think like, so. Caucasian. I don't I just feel Asian. So, white. You know, I, yeah, I, I don't here. look at any of the boxes. <laughs> Um, but I thought it was interesting because when she when she goes in and they're like, OK, your race is uh, what? And, they're, and she says Caucasian and the interviewer kind of gives her a strange look and says Caucasian and what? <laughs> and I was like, whoa, man, like that is incredibly, incredibly rude. But it's I mean, I don't know how many times you've gone through international um, customs they're all rude. They're all like that. I got harassed by a border agent once for being Canadian and having a green card. And he was saying, Wait, are you kidding me? Yeah. He was like, like, you know, we can take this away anytime, right? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I've never had that experience oh, before. Just me. Then. But it's interesting because um, she, she gets an O one visa which is like the special specialized skill visa and then everyone else has like the n1 visa which is you know just like the regular visa and you have like a longer period of time that you have to work as an indentured servant and um we noticed that like the o1 visa holders are pretty much all white like they're all white ladies yeah and okay so it was endlessly amusing, or not maybe not amusing, maybe a little depressing, that you have this great technology for time travel, and there are so many applications you can use it for. But what do the corporations of the future use it for? To bring in cheap labor for their resorts. Yeah, when, when uh, Polly said <laughs> that she was an upholsterer who repairs old furniture, I was like, what are you going to do? with that skill in in the future you know like uh, <laughs> i thought they would hire like more doctors or or you people would who think work in... so right because yeah. like, the entire idea of this time travel like shifting is like okay in the future population has been decimated we don't have enough skilled workers so we need to bring people from the past before they get killed by the virus to you know take up these posts or that's how i would think but no it's like all right, there's not enough people to work at our resorts and to like make this into like a tourist destination. We need to bring in cheap labor from the past before they all die. Because like we've seen in this pandemic, the people most hardly hit by pandemics are the poor, right? Yes, yeah. And let's bring them in so we can have more labor to serve our rich clients. Yeah, and if you think about like in the first chapter, uh, before Frank gets sick and they're seeing the advertisements for Time Razor, he says they don't advertise this to the rich. <laughs> and it's totally true because the rich can afford the really expensive health insurance, health care to, you know, recover mm-hmm. from the flu. Whereas everybody else, they, they need to like be indentured servants right, to even have access to it. There is a cure by now. The cure came back from the future, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not sure if it was like, like a full on cure or if it was. Um, it was treatment, at least. It was. Yeah, it was. Treatment it was. They, they were at, able at to the save Frank, least. who was like, you know, almost dead when when Polly left. Yeah, and like six months later, he's fine. So yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll talk about Frank later because that's we gotta we gotta unpack that whole like the romance angle of this time travel romance, um, or romance with a question mark. But I thought it was really interesting on how, like, time travel, there is so much bureaucracy, right? Like, they don't tell the people who are applying to stuff, like, all of the small print uh, things that are, like, hidden in, in, like, the terms and conditions. I mean... And- when everybody gets to like the the I guess like terminals, like no one knows where they're going, no one knows what they're doing, and they're just giving out false information. And it's like, yeah, that is pretty much like that's like cor- everything. Yeah, that's I mean that's pretty much like corporations one hundred and one, right? Like, do any of us read the end user license agreements anytime we sign up for anything online? Probably not. Do we read everything in our mortgage? Do we read everything in? Like the employment contracts that we sign, probably not, right? Um, and they're counting on that. And and that way they can say, well, you signed this, so we can do this. And 
It's, but do you have a choice though? Because like <laughs> Polly goes to save Frank's life, and she's going to do it no matter what. It's just. Uh, I mean, isn't that just like institutions taking advantage of the poor and vulnerable? Like oh, this course. is kind of like it, it. I mean, all time travel stories or all science fiction stories are allegories, right? They're meant to shine a light on our lives to make us think about how, you know, what th- are what are the things we're doing now that will lead to this hypothetical future. And like nothing that Time Razor is doing is anything new. It's stuff that's been going on since the beginning of like essentially corporations, right? The beginning of, you know, you know, um, capitalism as like the main form of, of business and economy in, in the world. And yeah, Polly's story is kind of her dealing with that, like dealing with the ways that corporate entities and institutions take advantage of people who are desperate yeah yeah and the thing is because she is like oh one visa and because she can pass as white and pass as like someone who is uh of higher status like she i thought the code switching was really interesting you know (laughs) like she thinks at the very beginning that if she's polite like and kind of like asserts herself that she'll get what she wants kind of like oh if i pretend to be a karen they'll give me like all of the answers that i'm that i'm looking for uh but then once she kind of you know falls from grace uh she has to like be you know she has to be silent keep her head down that is the only way to survive um this is like totally totally random but the whole like when she's when she's going through like the psychological exam or whatever t- in order to like pass the uh, O one visa, and like how they tell her that she's going to nineteen ninety three, but she's actually being rerouted to ninety eight because that's the time period that her employer needs her, and they never inform her yeah. because it was just like a like a, an administrative error, and it just reminded me of when I went to go get my citizenship test, <laughs> uh, like. You know, it's a really big building and the security guard was like, oh, go to like the fourth floor. So I went and I'm like waiting and waiting and they're still like not calling my my number. And I was like, well, it's like the government. Everything is slow. So I guess, you know, like if they're like an hour long wait, it's fine. So I wait like an hour and a half and I was just like, what the fuck is this? So I <laughs> go up to like I go up to like one of the uh the staff and i'm like hey i'm here for my citizenship test and the security guard told me to come up here and they're like oh no 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 you're in the wrong floor it's like the second floor and then i go to the second floor and like the the people there are like oh like you're you you missed your appointment so you have to like reschedule it and you know with citizenship tests like it's it's like months of of like rescheduling so i said fuck no, I am staying here until, you know, like someone doesn't show up or whatever. And that's what happened. But that's pretty uh, bold. Yeah, that. But anyway, like it was just like a lot of bullshit where it totally was not my fault. But the government was saying, no, it's your responsibility to like know where where you're supposed to go. And it's your (laughs) fault for like not paying attention. And it's like, but you gave me the wrong information. So like. Yeah. Like, what the hell? <laughs> and that's kind of how time racer is, right? Everyone has their own specific thing they're doing and they don't care about anyone else. So if if someone else messes up, it's at least it's not their fault. And that's kind of, you know, um as someone who was like in a past career or life has worked not in government but with government. I want to see a lot of people working in government are like that where it's just like I just care about my little domain and anything outside of it is not my fucking problem. Right. And it's, I mean, it goes back to just the journeymen, right? The people who travel to the future to work aren't seen as people. They're seen as like company, property, and resources who have no rights, right? Everything they do is a cost to the company. And so that cost is, instead of being subsidized by the company to like, give them a better experience, they're re-diverted back to their workers, like inundating them with even more debt. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I don't know if they can unionize, but they should really probably start a union. 
at some point, right? <laughs> like what I found really interesting was like Polly gets to the future and um, everyone kind of expects her to know like the history of what happened after the pandemic. And uh, like she finds out that America and the United States had like yeah, two Amer- separate countries America now. has broken up with the United States, <laughs> which... Okay, it's it's a little cheesy, but also really hilarious that that's how they decided to split the country, which is this side is America and this side are the United States. I mean, if you think about it with like the Civil War, like, wasn't that what they were aiming for? The South wanting? I mean, even then, though, at least they have different names. It wasn't just the United States literally cut in half. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It was very interesting and funny to me because uh, they just expected her to know that it, it was like two separate countries and that she wasn't a citizen because she wasn't here when America was founded. And therefore, she's on a visa, even though she was sent by the company to work there. And, you know, she's kind of treated as as someone who who's pretty much stupid because you know, she doesn't know all the things that she should know. She's taking the wrong bus. And it turns out that, like, you know, the bus driver was was wrong, like, in, in terms of, like, picking <laughs> her up. And it was just like, oh, it's not my fault. Like, it's your fault for, like, getting on the wrong bus. And, yeah, it was just, like, a lot of um, of blaming. Yeah, I mean, this story at its core is about Polly's refugee experience right her it reminded me a lot of the map of salt and stars which we read a, about a year ago i want to say um which was about a syrian child's journey like as escaping her war-torn country like given this story isn't as bleak they're still escaping like certain doom um but it's about like basically her becoming a second-class citizen having to figure out how to survive and I think it was a really smart move for Tia Lim to cast her main character as like a white woman who has to like kind of become the second class citizen because of a status that like she had no choice but to accept. Right. Because I feel like um, for better or worse, having a white character makes it more like I, I, it feels icky to say this, but like probably more relatable to a lot of mainstream readers who can, uh-huh. you know, relate to her better, I guess. Um and that way, the message of like, you know, here is what an immigrant refugee goes through in order to even like, you know, find a new life in a place where like because of arbitrary decisions on like who isn't isn't a citizen and borders and things like that. Like she has to go through all this bullshit, right, where people don't even treat her as a human being. Yeah. And it also like reminds me of like a lot of immigrants in this country where in their former countries and in, in, in like the motherland, they had like really uh well-paying or respectful jobs and by circumstance they came to america and all of that status and prestige from their original country is just lost like no one gives a fuck yeah it's like it's like oh you were a doctor in your former country well you have to go through med school again in america so (laughs) you can like treat parent uh, treat patients in english or or whatnot and it's just Yeah, it just kind of reminded me of that, because even though Polly is, you know, in a field where, you know, they specifically recruited her for this job to repair furniture, like, she's still treated as, like, terrible. But at the same time, like, she understands that it could be a lot worse, because, like, when she looks outside the window, she sees, like, where all of the N1... um, workers are are like you know they're showering outside there's no privacy they're living in contain in in shipment containers and she's like well at least i'm not them yeah and i mean they're they're doing the jobs that no one else wants to do which is like a little on the nose allegory for like migrant workers here right like they're they're the people doing the jobs that that quote-unquote regular americans don't want to do even though they're still mad at them for taking jobs and so, like, I want to talk about the question of, like, why people do this, right? Like, why go through all this? Like, because Polly's reason is not for herself. Like, a lot of people did this to survive, to get jobs. They traveled with their families. They, it was a way for them to live through the pandemic. But Polly did it to save Frank. I mean, you can argue whether or not it was a selfish reason. Um, it was definitely an impulsive reason. 
and it was for someone else, right? And Frank kind of like reuniting with Frank, who at this point she still believes to be the love of her life, becomes her driving force for like the first eight tenths of the novel. Yeah, um, I had a lot of feelings about. <laughs> Polly and Frank's relationship because like first off like they're boyfriend and girlfriend they're like as serious as they are they're not married and she's not like a family relative so I just found that like I'm just like you're 23 and you're gonna go you're gonna you're gonna sign into indentured servitude for a relationship that you know might not have been as stable as you thought (laughs) you thought it might be like um, you see it with like the other uh, indentured journeymen. They're like, "Oh, it's nice that you know you did this for your boyfriend. You did this out of love, and you believe that you'll be reunited again." But that's something that happens in fairy tales. That's not something that like <laughs> actually happens. And I, I seem to kind of like line myself up with that opinion. I was, I was just like, "Why, why are you doing this?" But at the same time, I'm like. I haven't been in that position of of given the option to save a loved one. And it's like, yeah, yeah. And it kind of becomes her. I mean, it drives her throughout the story. It also gets her in a shitload of trouble. I mean, her trying she to find not Frank. thinking for. Yeah, yeah, she was she made some real bad decisions. <laughs> um, But I think. Yeah, I. I. I I can understand why she did it, even though I don't agree with what she did. Um, but that's us being having the benefit of knowledge of having read their relationship through like an omniscient third person narrative. Um, because I mean, even in the flashbacks, like where they were at the time when Frank contracted the illness was not a very like stable time in their relationship, right? It was kind of like they were kind of on shaking ground. They were maybe starting to reconcile. And maybe that led to her decision, like, okay, like, we were just starting to, like, make up for this disastrous DC trip. Um, Like, I don't want to lose this now. And it ends up losing way more than she thought she would. Um, But, like, Frank during that DC trip was kind of a dick. Yeah, like, I mean, I think it's just, like, a difference of values. Because Polly, the entire time, she's like, well, like, we'll have, like, all of these holiday trips in the future. Like, why do we have to like go do all of these touristy things in dc like why can't we just stay in the hotel and just be i don't know just like be lazy bums yeah a vacation should be a vacation right so yeah but they have different different definitions of how they want to spend their time and what's considered to be quote-unquote like romantic or couple activities and that was like the first sign to me where well, not the first sign, because like at the very beginning when I was reading this book, I was like, <laughs> yeah, Frank is not like, like, I don't know about this decision to go save someone who, you know, is your boyfriend and you're, <laughs> you're, I mean, there are married couples out there who well, you're a practical kind of fall logical apart. person. So, you know, obviously you would probably spend more time weighing the pros and cons of, of doing this. I mean, this, okay, this is really funny because I am a very cynical person when it comes to, like, romantic relationships, but, like, I've been in a relationship that's been, like, it's been 10 years since <laughs> I've been with my partner. Um, I've been with Dan since I was 21, um, and, like, you know, like, it was, like, what, like, six months into our relationship where I said, hey, I'm gonna move to the other side of the country after i graduate um so that's what i'm gonna do and i was totally expecting the whole like breakup thing because i was like (laughs) long because like in my in my opinion like long distance is it's just not something that i was willing to put myself through but like literally as soon as i said i'm moving to la he was like okay like when do we want to (laughs) move and i was like you're planning to come with me and it was like yeah like i i want to be with you so yeah like when do you want to do this and that's something that does not happen and so you're saying in your relationship your partner is the poly i mean i think (laughs) we're both very uh considerate (laughs) with with uh with our values and just compromising and stuff but like it is it is very 
rare. And, you know, for someone who is in that type of relationship, I like I had my cynicism, so I could <laughs> not help but be cynical to um, cynical about like Polly and Frank's relationship. But she is like she is still young. Their relationship is like maybe at this point two years old, right? Which is still relatively early. I guess in the 80s, it might have been a long time. I don't know. 80s values I don't align with because I don't know them. Um, especially 80s in like the upstate New York um, <laughs> um, culture. I mean, you mentioned the difference in the way that they perceive like, or they value like the present and the future. And those are things I think they might have been able to work out given more time together. But this thing happens, the pandemic, which rips them apart. It did pose the question of like, how much are you responsible for someone else's life? And like how much is how much self-sacrifice is too much sacrifice? Yeah. Is that right to like is that right to 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 do? Um, is it selfish in a way to sacrifice that much for someone you love without considering their wishes? Because Frank tells her not to go. <laughs> yeah. And like I kind of want to talk about like like I think we should talk about when she does eventually make it back to Buffalo, right? And this is after she like gets literally like con twice i want to say not con but like you know she gets set up by her boss to take a fall for his mistakes which is you know something bosses yeah which yeah. is you know um which is really messed up i mean do you have any thoughts on baird and his like bullshit um i think baird was an interesting character because he represented what could have happened to polly because mm -hmm. he had the option of being a journeyman but he didn't decide to do that so he watched his partner die um whereas like with polly you know she chose to to be this indentured servant and she's going through all this hardship but there is a possibility that she can reunite with her love and be able to pick the pieces back up so the reader is kind of questioning like who like who is suffering more <laughs> in, in this case like is it better to be with your loved one and kind of have spend the time that you have together or is it better to um you know make these sacrifices and hope for a future that is not guaranteed i don't know like for personally i would not do the whole journeyman thing i would probably stay behind and be like uh bard or whatever his character's name is um <laughs> <laughs> i mean like, yeah i mean this might just be the perspective like maybe because male and females are separated but most of the characters we find in this like intentional servitude status are women and especially women of color right like we have to think about it in in like terms of are women expected to sacrifice more than men um and I would have to say yes, <laughs> like, because like if you if you look at like the 1980s, for example, like sure there was a lot of pro uh, progress in like feminism, like you're seeing like women get more jobs and of course like fight for um for like autonomy in terms of like uh having rights to birth control and also like being able to divorce and still being able to retain some uh, kind of property or whatever. A lot of things were in the works and yet it was not common. It was still expected for women of that time to just give up everything for their family. And it makes sense to me that a lot of the people who did become journeymen were women and they did it to save their husbands and their sons and and whatnot. Yeah, and some part of me, I mean, I'm sure a lot of readers felt this, was like, did Frank take advantage of that kindness? Which he totally did, right? I mean, we can skip ahead to, well, okay, do we want to skip past the part where, do you, okay, do you have any thoughts on when Baird, like, stabbed Polly in the back? Uh, I kind of expected it, like, from... <laughs> Like, the fact that he was drunk most of the time and didn't do any work, I was just like, yeah, it's gonna, it, you know, it's gonna bite her in the ass because he asked her to steal something for him. And, like, I was just like, don't do it. Like, what, like, what are you doing? Well, he like, used can you Frank as, like, 
her weakness, right? He used Frank As to get her, her we- to steal stuff. Yeah, yeah. But she should have thought it through. But at the same time, you're put in a very desperate situation that most people would not imagine themselves in. So it's hard to say like how you would react. But it was just, it was just like, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna backstab her. And of course, um, because she was an O one status, it made sense to me that like for the story to progress, she would have to be demoted Mm. and kind of endure um, the hardship that a lot of women of color face in this book. So I like, I kind of expected the trajectory of her path, uh, pretty predictable, but like not in like a bad way because it was believable. Yeah. And there's an interesting thing when she becomes a, a N1 worker where all of a sudden her whiteness is pretty much taken away from her. What was the thing that Cookie said to her? Like, oh, you were white until you were broke? Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Cookie was a great character. Something- I like Cookie a lot. Yeah, she reminded me a lot of like uh, older Asian aunties. Yeah, she was like all of my Vietnamese friends' mom. That's Cookie. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when people saw her afterwards, they all assume like, they assume she was Hispanic, Hispanic, right? They would talk to her in Spanish, even though she, you know, identified as Caucasian. Yeah, and also like because like Tia Lim is also mixed race, mm. so I, I would imagine that that was drawn from her own personal experiences of like never being white enough or Asian enough, yeah. uh, depending on like where she is. Because I'm sure that like in in Canada, which is where she uh, went to school. Actually, she went to school in Houston, and I think she lives in Toronto now. Okay. But I'm guessing that, like, she gets questions all the time being like, oh, like, what kind of Asian are you? Like, you don't, <laughs> like, you don't look white. You must be something else. Um, yeah. But then when she goes to Asia, when she goes to Singapore, which is where she grew up, I'm sure she probably gets the same question, but it's, like, in inverse. Yeah. So it really depends on, like, the environment that you're in. And when you're not like, and who and and who people believe belong yeah, there, yeah, and who people right? believe, yeah. Um, um, the whole thing with no Noberto, yeah, <laughs> and like there is a part where, um, so he he you know proposes a scheme to her, and uh, she's like, well, how do you know about this scheme? And he's like, oh, well, there's a fixer and he's going to get a percentage. Oh, I, was, I was yeah. just like, he was definitely getting scammed. Like, <laughs> I, was like, I was just like, what are you doing, man? Like, think, like, think things through. And you're supposed course, to be the smart, like street savvy one. And of course, you know, he gets swindled of all of his money. And uh, the whole whole deal with the fixer is they were going to provide him with like the pregnant urine sample because the whole point of the scheme is to say, hey, we're a couple that are. Uh, that's expecting so give us like the extra income the extra Mm -hmm. uh, extra goods to start a family and now that they don't have the evidence to apply for this special treatment he's like oh i'm gonna try and like rape you so that you get pregnant and it's only gonna be for like one or two years and then and then you can like do whatever you want and it just made me think about the women who didn't have a noberto like they were like probably like kidnapped and raped solely for the purpose of of like um yeah their rapist getting ahead and it was just like a very like uncomfortable feeling that was a really sexual assault yeah i mean i was kind like you don't expect it because he seems like a good dude but at the same time he's not someone that comes from privilege right he has he's the privilege of being a dude but he's still someone who is under the thumb of the company and under the thumb of debt. And I mean, the part where he attempts to rape her was really uncomfortable to read. What did you think about his like turnaround? Did you expect him to come back around and like kind of no, redeem himself? No, I totally did not. I did not expect him to pay off her debt and like get her a, a ticket to Buffalo. That was like totally unprecedented, <laughs> unprecedented in my opinion. Um, Do you think it's out of character? I feel like he did seem like a, at least a guy who wants to be a good dude. Yeah, because if you think about his backstory, um, when he was like in love with uh, his girlfriend, Marta, um, like he was pretty happy living in the wilderness and like not caring about, you know, making money or uh, 
you know, being somewhat important in society. But, you know, his, you know, his girlfriend left him because she couldn't stand like being poor. (laughs) And that kind of drove his decision to, you know, you know, make money, try to be autonomous, be the boss. And I think after losing pretty much everything he saved in in like the past decade and him doing something that he thought he would never do like it makes sense to me that like he would try to redeem himself i just didn't think that he would redeem himself like to that extent yeah like yeah um but that leads Polly to return to buffalo in the the new united states which Again, she is no longer a citizen of because, <laughs> and I think this was something that was really amusing to me was the fact that like the United States government dissolved and reformed as two countries, which I feel like our current government is on the brink of every single day over the last like four years. I know, right? Um, but yeah, like she returns to Buffalo and sees that everything has changed, and she finally finds Frank and his daughter. I guess I I want to say I was not surprised that Frank kind of moved on without her. I mean, I think I feel like the whole entire book was kind of leading up to this moment, right? Where like the sole reason for her to survive and to like get out of indentured servitude, it would turn out to be that nothing was there for her at the end. Yeah, I I kind of figured from from like the photograph that he sneaked into her bra like in the very first chapter when she's going to the time machine because it just felt like because she thinks that he's giving it to her to say like hey like don't forget about me like you know like we're gonna be together again this is a memento but to me it was like a goodbye present (laughs) and i was like oh yeah he's totally not gonna wait like because, you know, this this sounds like an action that someone would do knowing that they're never going to see their loved one again, whether it's through death or through other circumstances. I mean, I feel like it's in character. Like we mentioned, like Frank is someone who cares about like experiencing everything now. And I think Frank was probably thinking either if he dies or he never sees her again, he wants her to remember them as they were. Whereas she was always like, no, we're going to be together again. Why are you doing this? Then she ends up burning that picture, right? Or getting rid of it. I mean, she couldn't have brought it anyway because all paper stuff gets destroyed in in the time travel. Yeah, but she brought her baseball cards. Yeah, but that was like laminated or something. (laughs) Like, like, I I, I don't know. But she she does tear up the photograph and... You know, she thinks that she doesn't need it and she regrets it later on. Um, But I was surprised by how quickly he moved on. And I think Polly was also very surprised and also horrified. I mean, so was Donna. Donna was like, what the fuck, dude? Donna was great. Donna was probably my favorite character in in this book. She was like, you come back without my niece and now you have a kid with this other woman? It ain't right. No. It ain't right. The fact that like, like that he met his ex wife at the hospital where he was recovering, and then got married to her, like what two years after Polly disappeared, like it was it was very very quick. I don't. I think it was months. Right? Was it? Like he recovered after six months. I mean, they got and, married because he knocked her up. Yeah. Yeah. Which, like, you know, he was saying like, oh, I needed comfort. I needed someone to like. You know, I, I just needed some somebody to like warm my body or whatever. And it's just like that's such a typical excuse. That's that like a, a lot of that's guys like give. I mean, yeah, that's totally a something an F boy would say. That's something that like every you know, you know how like in, in college there's always that one person who has like a significant other who's like still in high school or whatever, and it's just like and, but, and like they that's tell where their... I thought this anecdote was gonna go. I thought you were no, talking no, about like the, the, the person who was like always in a relationship. No, I was talking about like so. Okay, so like maybe I phrased this wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> like there's always someone in college who has like a significant other, whether or not like they're in high school or they went to a different college. Okay, that's a little bit better. Mm. Um, and they there's always one who thinks that they're gonna like make it despite the distance. 
Whereas like everybody right. else around them are just like, we're talking no, about you're the, in college. What, what did you guys call it? Because we call it the turkey drop, like Thanksgiving turkey drop. I, like, I don't know. I was not <laughs> friends with those people, <laughs> <laughs> Like I, which I guess just says something about me. I'm I'm a no nonsense person. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I did have a roommate, though, who like it was like sophomore year of college. She was engaged. And uh, her fiance was like, like you know, not in college. She was like older, older. Oh wow! Um, I think he, I think he was like twenty five or whatever. And like at this time, we were we were like nineteen, <laughs> twenty, and like you know, I would just be like, hey, yeah, like you know, good for you. <laughs> and inside, I'm just like, this is not gonna, this is not gonna work. And if it does work, like I commend the guy, like. <laughs> This just seems like a, a doomed relationship. And that's kind of how I felt about like Polly and Frank. I'm like, it's like, oh, sweetie, like, did you really think that this was going to work out? Just, yeah. I mean, yeah. the root of Polly's relationship with Frank is he's probably her first like serious, serious boyfriend, right? I think. She- I mean, it sounded like her first boyfriend was serious, but in a way where he was like a total like bastard who yeah you know, was probably abusive and she just you know like frank was like the first good guy that she dated i mean he got her furniture back for her right that was like the catalyst for their relationship and you know i i think i agree with you to a certain extent that if the pandemic hadn't happened if they had more time together they may have like worked worked out um and this is just my general thoughts on relationships. Uh, if you don't grow together, you're not going to survive together. <laughs> and a lot of the times, like, you know, long distance wise, like it doesn't work out because, you know, one person doesn't put in as much effort as the other person. Uh, and it happens to couples, you know, who have been living together for a very long time, but, you know, they change as a person. You can't expect someone to stay the same after 12 15 years which was like a thing that that like polly <laughs> kind of realizes um you know for her it's only been a couple of months since she took this job as took this contract as an indentured servant but for frank it's been it's been like over a decade and uh when they do try to like sleep together she's unable to do it because he is just so different from the frank that she remembers yeah what did you think about um, Future Frank? Uh, Future Frank. Um, I will say that Future Frank is more along the... If she met Frank now, like if she met the Future Frank uh, instead of like her present day Frank, I think Future Frank would have been a better choice as a partner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He just seems to have like more of a shit together and, you know, is more. I mean, he is 13 years older, right? He is 13 years older. I mean, we forget that when they were dating, at least she was 20, like 23. Like, I want to say he was still in his late 20s, maybe. Like, I know know he was definitely older than her. Yeah, he was definitely older than her. And like, as recent 20 somethings, we both know that 20 somethings are kind of dumb sometimes. I don't know. I think I was pretty smart as a 20 something, but you know what? Like what I, 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 I'm an old cynical person. Like I've always been an old cynical person ever since I was like 10 years old. You're an old soul. Really? I'm an old soul. Um, but I think with Frank, he, the future day Frank is definitely less selfish and he has more regrets, like way more regrets, more, more regrets. I think he appreciates like he understands sacrifice more than um present day frank but was also kind of a coward right he did oh of course like 100 <laughs> percent a coward like who the fuck gets married like two years after well and then your when ex does this thing for you your ex life changing life saving thing for you like yeah, and then technically you never broke up with her, right? So, and then when when the girl comes back to like find you as you both promised, you send your daughter to go shoo her away. That was yeah, up. that was that was fucked up. Yeah, 
That was very, um, I mean, it was understandable, but at the same time, my my sympathy for him was just not, <laughs> it was just not there. Um, what did you think about them parting on Amical? I'm glad they were able to at least reconcile, even though, like, things were ever going to be the same. I know, I'm pretty sure there were a lot of readers out there who were pissed by the ending, because <laughs> I'm sure they expected, like, more of a resolution. Um, and it just kind of left a lot of questions because it's like, what is Polly going to do now? Like, is she going to have like a career? I mean, she's working at this dilapidated library that's going to be raised to the ground at some point. I was more upset at the fact that I feel like Frank owes her a lot. Yeah, he owes her so and much. And it seems like he's trying to weasel out of it, right? Like much like a lot of the people who are from the future in this story, like trying to shirk their responsibilities because they can because Polly is someone who will forgive them because Polly at her core is a maybe still a naive like innocent person even though she's been hardened by by all these experiences I think like she does what she needs to do whereas with Frank he is not that kind of person (laughs) I mean you see it like in like was it their first date with the squirrel how like the squirrel got run over and he was like oh we should end the squirrel's like misery because it's gonna die like it's better to just like kill it now and she's like okay but he's unable to do it so she does it and he's just like wow like like i admire you because you're able to like do the things that needs to be done or or like you're fair and it's just like dude like you suggested yeah that like that you do this and you didn't even follow through and same thing with like her like him encouraging her to apply to that like furniture repair program at a college and you know she says like oh like i'm not gonna do it but she applies uh and she gets in and then he's like disappointed (laughs) and you know like he makes the effort to drive six hours to see her but at the same time he's like complaining about the distance so the entire time i'm just like this guy it was red flag after red flag right (laughs) it was red flag after red flag so it did not surprise me that you know he didn't follow through on his promise and that like in the future when they do get reunited he doesn't do nearly enough to like redeem himself i mean we all have that friend right who like we have no idea why they're with their significant other there are all these glaring red flags that all of us can see, but sh- like they obviously can't, and we can't figure out why. And I feel like Polly was that friend for all the readers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I was fine with the ending. Yeah. <laughs> long, story, long story short, I was fine with the ending. I think it fits uh, very well with um, the time travel theme. I don't know if you noticed, but the um, future the the future chapters where she's like in america um it was written in past tense but Mm -hmm. then with the flashbacks with frank it was written in present tense so um to me it was like a very interesting uh juxtaposition because it's like she's constantly living in this time period where like everything about her relationship was rosy us as readers were like no it was red flag after red flag <laughs> like this this is not a relationship that's going to work out and finally when she is able to kind of accept the reality of the situation like i think all of the other um thoughts about frank is in past tense from there there was like that one short chapter where it was written in first person um it kind of threw me off because i was like who's talking right now (laughs) for a second i thought it was frank but it was actually polly and um it made me curious as to how different this book would have been if it was written purely from her perspective Mm. because i feel like it would have been interesting to get more into her head of like like i'm in love and this is like like this is going to happen. Like, I feel like it would have been more powerful in terms of like, would it be more powerful or more frustrating? Cause like, I don't yeah, know if I want to say it would be more frustrating. It would be more frustrating and it would have made the betrayal. Like it would have made it hurt more, mm. but I understand the whole omnipotent like narrator 
style because it's you know it's a time travel story. In other words, I feel like Rira yeah. wanted more more hurt. She wanted more pain from this book than than it offered. Um, yeah, I think yeah, <laughs> more more pain would have been good. I mean, the um, entire book was like coded in like melancholic ennui, like you know where I mean, and it's something that we kind of can relate to now that we've also been through uh, are still experiencing our own you know pandemic given is not as bad as the one in the book yet um but this idea that the world will never be back to how it was right yeah yeah um nina from our goodreads forum uh she raised some good points um i'm just gonna read read them um Lim manages to not only describe in detail Polly's experience navigating life after time travel, but also makes the reader feel the constant tension of things never going the way we intend, how relentlessly little control Polly has over her life the moment she decides to use it to save Frank, and the realization of things never being the way they once were. Yeah. Uh, the melancholy of knowing things will never be as they were uh is a constant background <laughs> to an ocean of minutes. And I think, yeah, I yeah, agree 100%. I mean, and again, everything that um, Nina described maps like almost one-on-one -on -one with any refugee immigrant experience where you move to a new place and basically you're at the whims of the bureaucracy and the government and institutions of this new place and where they will allow you to live and work. And and no one tells you the rules either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um I okay, like this is this is my last point because we are um almost out of time. But what did you think about the difference between how America handled the pandemic in this book versus how like Singapore and I, like Sri Lanka and Taiwan dealt with I it? I did love that juxtaposition. That 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 part made me like <laughs> it was it made me chuckle, but also made me go, oh. Because it like again, it's these kind of pandemic what books in real life. Yeah, have a I mean, sci-fi authors, their job is to, you know, is to predict what the future would be given the current situation. And it's really depressing how most of these pandemic stories, like most stories about pandemics, is about the current government or institution's inability to handle one. Like, right. Um, and I mean, Singapore, like the, the little anecdote about Singapore being able to survive the pandemic because it was able to a close off its borders and b maintain trade relations with, and like, actually like kind of, um, sh um, um, a, because it closes borders and, and secondly, because they were able to share their resources with their neighboring countries in order to maintain trade and a sustainable ecosystem is it was it made a lot of sense because um in these times like if if the world had cooperated with each other covid probably wouldn't have been as bad as it is right now but because i mean i don't think it's going out on the limb to say that a lot of our problems currently in this country about covid vaccinations and the spread of the you no know, the delta variant right now a lot of it has to do with America's identity as like a nation of free peoples, which some people take to mean, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like with, with a lot of like Asian countries, like the, the reason why uh, COVID got there in the first place is because of like tourism. <laughs> and it's like, oh yeah, people who did not care about, other people's safety and health. Uh, they decided that they needed to go on vacation, and that's that. They were like patient zero for that country, and um, just like the thought of how a lot of other countries have dealt with COVID much better because you know they were more prepared. They have a better infrastructure for like healthcare, and they're not getting the vaccines because America is hoarding like most of the resources and it's just yeah. so indicative of like how <laughs> america functions as a country and how you know like we thought that the pandemic would be over by now or at least like with vaccination we're like okay we have like 
this percentage of people vaccinated, it should be safe enough to like go out and, you know, wear a mask occasionally, but not all the time. But now there's the Delta variant and we are pretty much at the same point as where we were last year yeah. around this time, which is like so frustrating because this would not have happened if people just wore their masks and gotten vaccinated. Well, and now we're being asked to be careful for the sake of people who aren't being responsible. Right. I'm just like, I'm just so <laughs> mad. Like, I know someone who was vaccinated and they got the Delta variant. And it's just, it's so infuriating that they got covid after they got vaccinated because someone who wasn't vaccinated spread covid around and it was it's just like like it makes like i like i should care about other people and be empathetic but it is very very hard when people do not give a shit about other people's like lives yeah i mean we're we're lucky that COVID isn't whatever this virus was in the notion of minutes, right? Or there's we'd be totally screwed. Like right now, we just you know there's no time travel to save us. My question to you, Marvin, is would you do the time travel option? I mean, I feel like we all kind of time traveled, right? Because what is 2020? Does anyone even remember 2020? 2021 is almost gone. Oh, shit, you're right. Ooh. I don't know. I feel like I would read the contract first. I mean, I already said that I would probably not go through with it. Like, <laughs> no way. I feel like as someone who is at least currently insured, I would probably, like, I would think about it. Like, if if, if I had no other choice, maybe. But um, I don't know. It's hard to say what you'll do until you're, you're met with that decision. Right. It's true. It's true. Uh, one one last point. I don't know if you like. You can edit this. Like this is like your third last point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can edit like whatever. Um, like when Polly goes back to Buffalo and she realizes that it's not the city that you know she left it. It just kind of reminded me of like how a lot of immigrants, including children of immigrants, they go back to their motherland and they're like, "This is not." like how it was when yeah when i left and i've like i've mentioned this in other uh episodes but like whenever i go back to seoul it's like it's just like it's been five years and everything is like all the roads have changed and there's like all these buildings <laughs> that like did not exist before i mean that's the thing with immigration right like when you leave a country when you leave a place that you lived in or is you're connected to that place stays the same in your mind until you go back. Whereas that's not the way the world works. Life goes on without you. And yeah, that totally is what um, her homecoming to Buffalo was like. Because not only did she come back, and much like the refugee experience, not only did she come back to her town that's totally changed, she went back to her, her the same hometown, but a different country now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nicely well, done, think- Thea Lim. Yeah, nice, <laughs> nicely done. Um, I I'm sorry for the people who who read this and were just like, I wanted a good fun time, but <laughs> sorry. I mean, um, it was never going to be a good fun time. It is, it is no, a, pandemic a pandemic dystopia book. book. Yeah, um, we read a pandemic book during a pandemic. I think. So yeah, really. I mean, I, I read some reviews of people about people uh, accusing it of being a bait and switch, whereas like it was sold to them as a time travel book but it was really about this refugee experience. But I thought it was a really good refugee experience book with the trappings of time travel. And like, okay, here's the thing. I have never read or seen a time travel story that wasn't about something else. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That's true. I mean, sorry, Thea didn't, um, I mean, Thea didn't go into the intricacies of time travel, but you know, again, that's proprietary knowledge of the Time Razor Corporation that um, Polly did not have access to as a um, laborer. So I don't know if you've seen the movie <laughs> Looper, but they kind of like do the same thing where they're just like, explain the mechanics of time travel to me. And they're like, time travel is fucked up. We're, we're going to just be sitting here complaining and debating for hours on how time travel works. No, we're not going to do that. And it's like, yes. Um, you just need to know that it exists and it works. Yeah, you just need to know that it exists and your <laughs> audience has to just believe it for, for a moment. Yeah. So, really. All right. Um, well, let us know what you thought about 
the notion of minutes by Tia Lim uh, by sounding off in our Goodreads forums, um, engaging with us on Twitter, and just um, I don't know, messaging us wherever on Instagram. Um, and yeah, just, did like, you agree with us? <laughs> Would you? <laughs> are you a are you a Polly Frank shipper? <laughs> um, would you do this time travel uh, contract? Please let us know in the comments. Yeah. And with that, um, that'll do it for our discussion of our July 2021 book club pick. Um, once again, Rhea, thanks for joining me in this time travel journey of this, you know, fictional United States. Yeah, yeah. I, I love talking about uh, how capitalism sucks with you, Marvin, every single time. <laughs> I mean, it's not our fault. That is the theme of like many of the books that we've read and a lot of fiction that's out there right now. True, true. <laughs> Although this book came out in 2018. Mm, that's true. Yeah. Um, all right. So on that note, uh, what are we reading for the month of August? We are reading Randy Ribbe's Patron Saints of Nothing. So it is a young adult contemporary novel about a Filipino American teen who flies to the Philippines to discover the truth about his cousin's murder. And the cousin's murder is apparently related to President Duarte's war on drugs. So also a fun time novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm um, looking forward to discussing that with you at the end of the month. But with that, that brings us to the end of this episode of Books and Boba. Thank you once again for joining us for another great month. We are coming up on our fifth anniversary. Yeah, fifth anniversary. Wow. We should probably do something. We should probably do something. Yeah. <laughs> Let's spend August brainstorming of something to do. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe we should actually meet in person. Oh. Like, I, I've seen you like once and that was like for like maybe two minutes that's true i think i was dropping yeah. off some food for you yeah you were dropping off something yeah. <laughs> yeah. all right well thanks right, for joining well, us on books and boba and we'll see you next time all right bye. bye everyone thanks for listening to books and boba this podcast was hosted by marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Brian, did you go to Saturday school as a kid? I sure did. Did you? Totally. Well, at our podcast, Saturday School, we don't teach a language, but we pass along the culture that we do know. And that's Asian American pop culture. Ada is a journalist, and I'm a professor and film festival programmer. We've watched a lot of great Asian American movies, and we want you to watch them too. Come listen to us as we look back at the pioneering films that have led us to today. 